our study of the Gunners' mercenary faction next brings us to the Mass Bay Medical Center in the heart of downtown Boston. This is a ruined hospital that the Gunners have taken over and fortified. From a game design perspective, this is one of the most elaborate, well-made dungeons in the entire game. There are half a dozen entries and exits into this place that lead into other buildings and other places of interest. You can spend and hours exploring this building and the structures around it, and it's easy to get turned around. This building takes you from the ground floor of Boston to the ruined overpass overlooking the city, to the insides of a parking garage, to a ruined cigar lounge, and to one of the tallest rooftops in the entire game. Despite the clear, monumental amount of effort that went into building this structure, it's not involved in any major quests in the game. The only quests that bring us here are a few radiant quests for some of the factions. Weathervane for the railroad to place Amila, for example. There are no terminals telling us its story, but we do find one holotape, and so we must reconstruct a story about this place from the set decorations that we find inside. But before going in, let us explore its exterior. Using a scaffolding stairway that we find near the entrance of the building, we can walk up to the various different roofs of the Mass Bay Medical Center. Here we can kill any gunners, and then continue along across some boards to the rooftop of the neighboring building. This leads to more scaffolding. That brings us to another boardwalk, which takes us to a fire escape ladder, bringing us to the ruins of a skyscraper. We find gunners here as well, whom attack you as soon as you arrive. He's playing games with us. Climbing up stairways, going from level to level, we finally get to a ruined bus that we can climb up into, which leads us out onto the rooftop of the apartment complex. We can then go over a plywood ramp to reach the overpass. This looming teal green structure is the Mass Bay Medical Center. It has a unique construction. The freeway goes right through the building. It also looks like a pre-war vertebrate has crashed into the top portion of the building. On the rooftop of a nearby blue building, we find and even more gunners. They're all part of the same outfit, and we will find our way to these gunners in a moment. Back down on the ground, on the eastern side of the building, we find the emergency section of the hospital. This is where the ambulances would arrive to deliver patients. We find it guarded by gunners, and we find a door with a gurney outside. Right across the street from this door is another emergency section. This is where the ambulances would unload patients on gurneys, check them in with the front desk here, and then bring them into the hospital. In the the back room we find one operating table. This must have been for absolute emergencies. And then on the other wall we find a door leading into the hospital. But let's start this exploration by going through the front door to Mass Bay Medical Center. The lobby floor is not well defended. The defenders are on the floor above us. They'll come and visit us in a moment. The reception terminal sadly doesn't have any pre-war history. It just allows us to release the nearby police protectron. We can then hack into it to turn it into a temporary companion. We see clear evidence of gunner inhabitation. We find the gunner barricades spray painted with their logo as is typical of the gunners. And then after a short while, they do notice us and come on down. The first to attack is an assault Ultron. After clearing the first floor and the second floor of gunners, we can continue with exploring. The door against the southern wall leads to the women's bathroom. This connects to the men's restroom through a broken wall. In one of the stalls, we find the skeleton of a man with his head in the toilet and a plunger pushing it in. Now, we could always explain this as playtime for the raiders, but wait, there are no raiders here. This is a gunner facility. Gunners tend to be far more serious. They don't do a lot of dark, morbid things just for fun like raiders do. Raiders will play with corpses and pose bones. But gunners? I'm not so sure. 
This could simply be a pre-war scene. Maybe in the chaos after the bombs dropped, the people inside this building began to fight. Maybe one of the patients or one of the family members waiting for a patient killed this person by drowning him in the toilet with a plunger. Heading out and going through the northern door, we get to a kitchen. This was likely a cafeteria serving patients and family members. We find a cash register, so transactions went on here. This wasn't just for staff. And in here, we find a porta diner. But no matter how many times we try, we just can't get that perfectly preserved slice of pie. Interestingly, against the eastern wall, we find a shrine of some sort. There are five picture frames, one of which is knocked over, two of which are elevated, and four candles, one which is still lit. This must be a pre-war scene. I imagine that after the bombs dropped, many of the patients and family that were in the hospital were locked inside and had to stay here. It's quite possible that they stayed alive for some time after the bombs dropped, and the survivors could have put up a shrine dedicated to the loved ones whom they lost during the initial blast. Maybe this was put up in their honor to help the survivors cope with the loss. Against the southern wall is another door that leads out of the building. This brings us to one of the emergency exits that we explored while we were outside. This is the one that has the gurney and the gunner that we killed. Heading back inside, we can explore the elevator shafts. None of the elevators work, and you can open a hatch in one of them to explore the shaft itself. The other elevator is stuck on the second floor, and you can hop on up if you use a jetpack to explore the second floor that way, but we're gonna continue along in a more traditional way and take the stairs. Tagging the stairs to floor number two, we can loot the corpses of the gunners that we previously killed, and walking along to the northeast section, we find a machine gun turret that's already been destroyed. Strangely enough, that weird jumping glitch happened all three times I did this dungeon when shooting this video. In the nearby wall, we find a door that leads outside. This takes us to the parking garage of the Mass Bay Medical Center. To the left, we find a door taking us to a stairway that brings us up or down, and to the right, we find a crashed monorail car. Now the level immediately above us in this parking garage is a small raider camp. After taking care of the raiders, we can go back and explore this monorail. This must have been the lead train car. We find the skeleton of the engineer hanging out of one of the windows. The rest of the monorail is still stuck up in the tube. We'll explore the rest of the tube in a moment. For now, let's go back through the door to the medical center. Winding our way back, we find a reception desk to the north, but something catches our attention turning south. In this lobby waiting room area, we find two cages. Are these pre or post-war cages? Surely they must be post-war cages because in the first one, we find a dead Minuteman. The modern incarnation of the Minuteman did not exist before the war, so these cages must have been placed here by the gunners, but wait, in the second cage, we find the skeleton of a pre-war service member. Wait, 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 wait. This is not making sense. Why would a hospital have a bunch of cages in the lobby? And why would they incarcerate a United States soldier? It's unlikely that the hospital came with these cages in the lobby. If these are pre-war cages, then they must have been transported here after the bombs dropped by some force, either the military or the government. They don't have their own facilities that they can use to incarcerate people. They have to come to a hospital and erect cages. This would be much more easily explained simply by saying that the gunners brought these cages here, but that doesn't explain this pre-war skeleton. We can always assume that the gunners placed it here on a lark, but I believe that goes outside the character of the gunners as a faction. That's something raiders do. It's not something gunners do. Gunners, however, are sometimes made from former raiders, so I suppose that that's always possible. Before we explore the northern room, let's head out the door, grab the buff out on one of the barricades, and head south to explore this emergency wing of this floor. To the right, we find a broken elevator, and inside, a machine gun turret. There are no other cars in here, and we can hop on down to see that this machine gun turret had been placed in the car next to a skeleton that was on a gurney. This leads us to a staircase that we can climb to bring us back to exactly where we were. This elevator just connected these two floors. This was the emergency entrance for ambulances. Heading out the door brings us to that exterior room with the wrecked ambulance just outside. Remember, it's here that we found a receptions desk for checking in patients that came via ambulance and some sort of tree 
triage room or minor operating room. Let's go back through the door to go back to the emergency section where we can check out the lobby to the emergency room. Here we find two skeletons, one male and one female lying on the couches and nothing more of further note. Heading back on up the stairs, we can now go through one big red door with an emergency sign on top of it, which leads us to another wing of the emergency room. Here we find a receptions desk and three doors. The leftmost door is locked with a novice lock. Inside we find some chems on the table, brain fungus on the wall, and other minor chems lying about. Door number two to the left has the skeleton of a dead service member lying on a gurney. It's interesting that many of these corpses that we find are in military uniforms. This tells us that many of the patients were soldiers when the bombs dropped, or that this hospital was continuing to function even after the bombs dropped, perhaps treating soldiers trying to restore order to downtown Boston. In the western room, we find another room with a skeleton on a gurney. This one is covered in brain fungus. And then back out in the hallway, we can find a terminal to activate the nearby medical protectron. Our poor police protectron got killed by the assaultron earlier. Let's go ahead and hack this guy and turn him into a temporary companion. The final door remaining is an expert locked door to the left. Inside, we find a harrowing scene. On the floor in the middle of the room is a huge pile of bones and ashes, the embers of which still glow in low light. Clearly, this was done by the gunners. We already know that bonfires are one of the favorite ways that the gunners dispose of the dead. We learned this when we explored Quincy. In the middle of Quincy is a huge bonfire filled with the bones of the people that the gunners killed when taking the town. What we see here may be the exact same scenario. In the middle of the pile of ashes and bones, we find a gas canister and strangely enough, an unused lighter. Uh, you'd think that Bethesda would have chosen a worn or used lighter because clearly it had been used to light this very fire. There are nearly two full skeletons sticking out of the ash pile and one body that has not yet completely had its flesh burned away. This person is wearing rags of some sort. It's a more recent skeleton. Nearby is a mannequin in a pink dress. That's strange. And on the nearby counter is a flamer with two big batches of flamer fuel. This is great for crafting jet fuel at a chem station. This mannequin is interesting because it's not typically something you find in a hospital and it's not typically something you find in a gunner encampment. What's it doing here and why is it in this room? Well, maybe raiders had inhabited this hospital before the gunners took over. The gunners, after killing all of the raiders, needed a way to dispose of the bodies and wanted to get rid of some of the raider decorations that proliferate raider installations. And so they used this room to light a huge bonfire to destroy all of the raider corpses and any settler corpses that the raiders had brought with them. Here they also torched any raider decorations like hanging bodies, spits, and mannequins. They then closed the door and locked it to allow the fire to rage and destroy everything. That neatly explains what we find in this room, in my opinion. At the same time, this is also likely a reference to Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. In this science fiction novel, books are banned and routinely torched on giant fires. Towards the last part of the book, the novel's protagonist, Guy Montag, faces off with one of the lead villains of the book, Captain Beatty. Captain Beatty was a fireman whose job it was to burn books. Montag rebelled and faced off against Beatty, holding a giant flamethrower. Montag murders Beatty by bathing him in flame from the flamethrower, but the way that Bradbury describes it is like this. And then he was a shrieking blaze, a jumping, sprawling, gibbering mannequin, no longer human or known, all writhing flame on the lawn as Montag shot one continuous pulse of liquid fire on him. Beatty flopped over and over and over and at last twisted in on himself like a charred wax doll and lay silent. So we already used a lore reason to explain the mannequin. This Easter egg also explains the mannequin and the flamethrower on the counter. Turning east into the room with the cages and then turning north, we find a room with a number of patient beds. Here we can loot some minor chems and ammunition. It's also here that we find a short syringe rifle, one of the few syringe rifles that we find in the game. The floor above has collapsed, forming a ramp that we can use to lead to the third floor. Here we find more examination rooms and what looks like another lobby in one of 
of the examination rooms, we find a skeleton of a man next to a toy truck. Maybe it was his favorite toy as a child, which comforted him in his final moments. Heading out of the ruined rooms, we come to the lobby on this floor, where we find one of the most confusing scenes in any building of Fallout 4. Against the western wall on the couch are the skeletons of three men, one of whom is holding a cigar and holding himself rather calmly. Looks like this man decided to welcome in the apocalypse with a stogie. Across from these three is the strangest thing I've ever seen in this game. We find three skeletons. A man, a woman sprawled out on his lap, and the skeleton of a child in a baby carriage. I know that in the past, I've said that Bethesda does not like to put dead children in Fallout 4. And this is more or less true. You can't kill children and we don't find child corpses. And yet here we find what is clearly a very small skeleton in this baby carriage. But this doesn't mean that the skeleton in the baby carriage belongs to a baby. After all, anyone could have put this skeleton in this carriage at any time over the past 200 years. And also, it's larger than an infant's body. Baby carriages are for infants, not toddlers. This skeleton the skeleton is the size of a toddler, not an infant. It's too large for this carriage. Also, the bones are the wrong proportions for an infant or a toddler. Babies have arm and leg bones that are pretty much the same length, but adults have leg bones that are far longer than arm bones. And in this example, even though the bones themselves are smaller, the proportions of the bones are that of an adult. So I think it's more likely that this is not the skeleton of a baby or even of a toddler or other child. I think it's more likely that this is the skeleton of a little person, a dwarf. But the strangest thing of all is that all three of these skulls are huge. They're huge. It's not just the baby's skull. The mother and father have giant skulls. The baby's skull has a bottle in its mouth, but the other two skulls are just as large. Here, look, these are the guys sitting on over at the couch and look at the size of their skulls. Normal sized human skulls. But this small family over on the other couch have huge, monstrously sized skulls. How on earth can we explain this? I can think of only three possibilities. The first is that raiders inhabited this building before the gunners got here. The raiders brought with them super mutant skulls. They found these skeletons in here, decided to put on a little scene, and they placed super mutant skulls on the skeletons of all three of these bodies. Now, it is possible, however, that the raiders found the skeleton of a little person in this lobby. And either not knowing about little people, having never seen them before, or thinking that it would be rather funny, they put the skeleton of the little person in the baby carriage and then put a super mutant skull on top of all three skeletons. Explanation number two is the pre-war explanation, and that's that this whole family suffered from some sort of debilitating giant skull disease, and, and the baby inherited it from the parents. I, I guess either this is a brother and sister that married each other and produced another child that has the same medical condition, or maybe there was some small social community of people with giant skulls, and this couple found each other on that matchmaking service for people with giant heads. <laughs> they fell in love, they married, and they produced a giant-headed baby. And then the bombs dropped, and here they lie, their giant heads confounding humanity for generations to come. The final explanation is that Bethesda didn't really care about how we would interpret this, and just had fun on a lark. That may be the most likely explanation. That we can't explain this with lore, and we gotta chalk it up to just Bethesda having fun. However, I'm going to choose to believe the first explanation, because it's the only one that I think fits in with the lore of the game. That raiders found the skeleton of a little person, placed him in a baby carriage, and then took three super mutant skulls and placed them on the skeletons in some sort of funny art piece. There you go, that's the best that I can do. On the chair next to this scene is a vault -Tec lunchbox, which we can save for producing our bottle cap mines. Opening the elevator door, we can loot some buff out on the ground. This is the elevator that we jumped through previously, but sadly it's non-functional. So instead, we have to go through the nearby door to access the staircase, which brings us to the next floor. Here we find yet another lobby with a skeleton inside. This is the skeleton of a woman lying face down next to a suitcase. And the door here brings us outside. This brings us to the Mass Bay metro station that directly connected with the hospital. Here we have to kill a few gunners. 
This metro station made it easy for citizens of Boston to commute to the Mass Bay Medical Center both for work or in case of an emergency. There are seats outside to wait for the next monorail and turnstiles to count passengers. There's a cash register on the desk for purchasing tickets. And upstairs we find what I think at one time must have been a little cafeteria or break room of sorts. The gunners or previous raiders had since put up a big cooking spit. But before that, we do find tables and chairs shoved in the corners. And against one wall, we find a small kitchen drink dispensers, a big stove, and some cash registers. There's also an advanced locked safe on the ground. Heading out, we can explore the monorail that we saw earlier when we were inside the parking garage. Looking left, we can look out the door to see that crashed lead car that had the engineer inside that we explored earlier. Turning around, we can run the full length of this monorail to end up on the roof of Hester's Consumer Robotics. I showed this off when I did my video on Hester's Consumer Robotics robotics, which you can watch here. There I explain why we find some dead settlers on the roof, and I explore what's inside this hatch. But we're not done with Mass Bay Medical Center, so let's head back through the monorail, back into the station, and through the door. This leaves us with one further avenue of exploration, the working elevator to the left. We can punch this button to take the elevator car up to the next floor. Here we find gunners on the platform above us, and they attack, one of whom tries to jump into a suit of power armor. I think we're being shattered. On the ground floor of this atrium, we find an armor workbench against the wall, and this is where the vertebrate had crashed through the building. Its broken wing forms a ramp that we can use to access the upper levels, and the vertebrate itself hangs down through the ceiling. We can even see the skeleton of the vertebrate pilot hanging out of the windows. This was a pre-war vertebrate, not a Brotherhood of Steel vertebrate. The pilot is wearing a United States military uniform. The gunners in their typical fashion have decorated it with their own logo. There's an etatronic on the first floor and inside there's a purified water. On the couch on this first floor lobby we find the skeleton of a man who must have been a patient. He's holding one of those rolling IV bag holders and someone has taken off his skull and placed it next to his skeleton. Moving up the vertebrate wing we can get to the second floor and there's nothing much of interest here except for the power armor that the gunner tried to gain access. To. Here there are two power armor workstations. Using a broken floor that has become a ramp, we can access the third floor of this room. And going around the room, we find the skeleton of a serviceman hanging outside of one of the windows. And continuing to the very end, we find more cages. One is open and the other has a Brotherhood of Steel scribe inside. I want to point out that the only post-war corpses that we've found in here have been related to other factions, and they have been in cages, a Minuteman and a Brotherhood of Steel soldier. This distinguishes the gunners from raiders. Raiders kidnap scavengers, settlers, and traitors, murder them, steal their belongings, and then play with their corpses. These gunners have kidnapped enemy factions, factions that offer resistance to what the gunners are doing. They kidnap them, place them in cells, likely for interrogation, before finally killing them. And then they leave the bodies alone. They don't mutilate the corpses afterwards. From this, we learn that the gunners are just much more practical. They're still evil and horrible, but the evil and horrible decisions they make come from practical need rather than morbid, perverse bloodlust. Heading through the door of the room with the skeleton hanging out the window, we can pass through the only door on this level to find what looks like an MRI. Inside the machine, we still find the skeleton of a woman who is being examined when she died. We know that it's an MRI machine instead of something like a CAT scan because in one of the hatches we find two high-powered magnets. MRIs depend upon magnets to work instead of CT scans which use x-rays. In the northern observation room, overlooking the MRI, we find the only holotape in this building, Bonnie's holotape. Wayne. I'm leaving this message with Marcy in case you come looking for me. Though I pray you don't. The military took over the hospital, and everything's gone to hell in the city. Things here, they're... It's bad, Wayne. People are dying every day, and most of the time all we can do is watch and try to make them comfortable. One of the other nurses told me she heard a radio signal that sounded like you and the boys. I don't know if it's true, if you're still out there, but 
we've got a way out. And I'm going to try to find you. That was the voice of Bonnie Turnquest. I did an entire video dedicated to her story and the story of her family called The Turnquist Family, which you can watch here. The important thing that we learned from this holotape is that the hospital was indeed functional after the bombs dropped. The military arrived, took it over, locked it down, and forced the hospital employees to care for the U.S. military servicemen who were wounded. This explains why we find so many skeletons in military uniforms and so many skeletons waiting in the lobbies wearing civilian clothes. We leave this room by going up a collapsed roof, which has formed a ramp, to another room with yet another lobby. Here we find two more skeletons of civilians, one of a man, one of a woman, next to a suitcase. The southern wall has the final elevator, which brings us out top onto the roof of the structure. To the east, we find a nice little relaxation area beneath a canopy on the roof. Here we can loot some buff out, some other chems, and some fragmentation mines. The gunners likely set this up themselves to relax at the end of a hard day overlooking the beautiful ruined city of Boston. From here, we can turn west to examine the crashed vertebrate up close. We can still travel across the broken portion to examine the rest of the roof, but there's nothing over here. The way out is using a window washing elevator on the eastern side of the building. This brings us down to the rooftop of the blue building where we killed those gunners while standing on the overpass at the beginning of this video. Here we can loot their corpses and loot an ammo box on one of the picnic tables. This door leads us to the ticker tape lounge and immediately we get attacked by gunners. The ticker tape lounge has an incredibly disgusting kitchen. Something happened here. There is dust and dirt everywhere. The gunners were using this as a kitchen for themselves. We find meats that otherwise wouldn't be here, like blood bug meat, for example. And on the bottom of one of the refrigerators is an interesting scene played out with toys. We find two aliens drinking from shot glasses next to a rocket ship with a vault lunch lunchbox here that says Grisha. I guess Grisha was the name of the young child who owned this lunchbox. But Grisha is a very strange name for a 1950s inspired xenophobic pre-war Boston. We find a lot of meat here. Some of it is grilling on a fire barrel and the rest is inside a big pot with a hacksaw. We could then go up the steps to examine the dining area up top. Here we find a skull on a table, an explosives crate under another table, and some ammunition on a back table. Here we find two skeletons, one of a woman holding a bouquet of flowers and the other of a man with a camera. The camera seems oddly out of place. Why would he bring a camera on a date? At least I'm assuming that this is a date. Or maybe this was an aspiring actress and the man with the camera was a photographer. Maybe they were creating marketing photos to give to agents. Now, while we've been exploring this part of the lounge, we've been hearing some banging. Where is this coming from? Well, we can go across the sky bridge and into the next room to find a gunner kicking a safe. The safe has an amazing selection of cigars. We find an entire box of San Francisco Sunlights, another cigar box, a stack of cigars, and a stack of stogies. These were not randomly generated. I've looted this safe in two other gameplays, and every time I found all of these same cigars. This tells us that the ticker tape lounge was a cigar lounge. Must have been a fun place to visit before the bombs dropped. Up the stairs, we get to the most loungy part of the lounge. Here we find a bunch of really resplendent chairs and ashtrays, big antique looking globes lying about, a chaise long. And that's it for the ticker tape lounge. We can head out the door to arrive on top of the overpass. From here, we can get down a number of ways. We can go back the way we first explored, across the apartment complex and then across the rooftop of the Mass Bay Medical Center to reach the floor, or we can continue exploring. There is plenty to explore up here. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of the Mass Bay Medical Center and the ticker tape lounge. Lounge. But how does all of this relate to the Gunners? What did we learn about the Gunners from these locations? Well, we know that the military occupied the Mass Bay Medical Center after the bombs dropped. Instead of allowing the medical staff to serve anyone in Boston, they took over the entire building and had the medical staff only serve military soldiers. It's the military who likely brought in those four cages that we saw in the building, possibly to punish hospital staff who did not obey or to restrain soldiers who might 
be suffering from PTSD or civilians who did not cooperate. This may help explain why we find the skeleton of a service member in one of the cages. But when the gunners found this place, they got rid of any of the raiders that had previously occupied the building, burned them in one room, and then began to use the cages for their own purposes. In typical gunner fashion, they fortified the entire hospital and used it as a base of operations from which to conduct sorties into the nearby buildings. From here, they took over and occupied the ticker tape lounge, the nearby parking garage and metro station, and they have a presence on top of the overpass. They used the cages they found here to imprison people whom are combatants, soldiers of enemy factions. Minutemen soldiers and Brotherhood of Steel soldiers. These they likely interrogated for more information before executing. We don't find settler, traitor, or scavenger corpses. They don't dismember and mutilate corpses like raiders do. They're very professional, though ruthless and they're also not afraid to enjoy themselves. They converted the entire ticker tape lounge into a gunner retreat. They have patio tables set out for feasting on the balcony of the lounge, couches set up on the roof of the hospital for relaxing and having conversations. I think it's clear that the gunners also are trying to enjoy life, that for them it's not all work and no play. What were you thinking? Ladies and gentlemen, when you first explored the Mass Bay Medical Center, let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. I, for one, am really impressed by the way that Bethesda put this whole thing together. It's fun to explore, it's not so large that it gets repetitious, it connects to many other places in downtown Boston, encouraging you to explore even further. There's lots of great loot, many challenging encounters, and a little bit of lore. We are well on our way through every single gunner location in the game. This is part of my big series on the gunners as a faction where we are exploring gunner locations to better understand them. I publish a new video every single day of the week, so if you like this topic and you don't want to miss my next video in the series, be sure to subscribe and click that little bell notification button to get notified when I publish my next video. And did you know that I have a t-shirt shop, ladies and gentlemen? That's right, I've got a fine selection of Oxhorn and Fallout 4 themed shirts, some of which include some of your favorite faction quotes from Fallout 4. If you're interested, you can find a link to my Teespring t-shirt shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning with a brand new video.